Thank you, J.D., and thank you, Alana, and the cultural programs of the National Academy of Sciences for organizing the exhibition and inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to get right to it because we're on a timer. So, um, so in 2008, I read, oops, I already skipped, hurrying myself along. <coughs> In 2008, I read about the pending completion of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault about 600 miles from the North Pole. And it's um, located so, so deep inside this mountain that is so tall that if both polar ice caps melt, uh, the collection of seeds will remain safe. So when I read that a present day, a current day Noah's Ark for seeds had been built, um, near the North Pole, I immediately wanted to photograph it. It took me a couple of years to get there, but um, I was inspired by the simultaneously pessimistic and optimistic aspects of a project to create the first truly global botanical backup system. On one hand, you have the gravity of climate change and political instability that's creating this need. And on the other hand, you have scientists and institutions and volunteers coming to work together from all over the world to create this really wonderful project. Um, so two years later, when I walked inside the seed vault, it took my breath away. I mean, it is bitterly cold and it is super loud because it's filled with the sound of rushed forced air rushing through the shelves. And um, you know, you're on the North Pole and you're also at one of the most biodiverse places on the planet at that point. And it's just such a profoundly moving experience. So in the time between my first impulse to uh, record this fallout vault and um, now Archiving Eden expanded into a wide ranging expeditionary project that took me to almost 20 national seed banks over five continents um, from Australia to Brazil. So the first seed bank I photographed was the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center that's about four hours from my home. And um, the Millennium Seed Bank from England what had sponsored a project to go and collect dryland flora from West Texas. Um, it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, the collecting of wild seeds because, for the most part, that's not a big activity in the United States. Um, they, first of all, they don't want to uh, decimate the populations of wild seeds, which is, I'm sure we'll talk about it when the conversation gets going. And then also, um, most of our efforts are focused on agriculture. But um, they were, volunteers were counting and um, placing the seeds one by one in these tiny folded envelopes to, seed, to send to the British Bank, the American Bank, and Svalbard. Um, so I had expected high-tech James Bond kind of facilities when I thought about seed banking and the Svalbard article that I had read. And the reality is that it's, um, it's orderly and it's organized to be as simple as possible so that really small teams can do it. Sometimes, you know, the work is done by one or two people that are out in the field for weeks at a time. So once the seeds are collected, cleaned, and stored, many national seed banks have facilities that pursue research on technologies and methodologies necessary to preserve seeds for 200 years or more. So um, crop improvements are also a, an important research uh, focus. So the crop research, this is from Brazil, the crop research is because food security for an ever-growing population is a big concern. And gene banks can't, can't afford to you know, fund and collect all seeds, so they have to make choices. And most focus on cultivated plants. So as I photographed this constant agonizing quest to preserve the spark of life in these tiny vulnerable seeds, many are only the size of a grain of sand like these orchid seeds, I, um, I, you know, I became really interested in this quest and how to adequately express the kind of bigger questions and the poetic concerns about um, the, you know, ex the questions about extending life or considering time at these radically different scales than we normally think of in our human day-to-day -day existence. So this led me to collaborations with research biologists at the seed banks who allowed me to use on-site x-ray machines 
to make images of the seeds. So Archiving Eden has two aspects. Um, the photographs of the spaces and technologies that uh, are required to to place um, these living materials in a state of suspended animation that we've been looking at. And then um, digital collages made from x-rays of materials safeguarded in the banks. Um, the extraordinary visual power of x-rays, which springs from this technology's ability to peer inside and see things that are invisible to human vision, um, allows me to create artworks that provoke questions and suggest connections between to different aspects of the philosophical, political, and social concerns that are embedded in the very act of seed banking. So as an example, 1,400 ash tree seeds, which is here on view, um, makes visible the scope of the collection efforts underway to uh, archive ash trees in the face of the imported invasive ash tree borer. Um, which it's a lenticular print, and so if you notice carefully, it'll change from green to brown as you move past the piece. So this t this tension between the stillness of the photographic print and then the continuously changing color kind of speaks to my focus on um, the impossibility of saving, of uh, stopping time and living materials, even though at some point we all want to do that. Um, and the color shift, in this case, from green to brown, also talks about, uh, you know, the drying process, which is part, which is embedded in the process, you know, cryogenic preservation. You have to dry them first. So the X-ray collages. Oh, and there are several other lenticular works in the show. This one is not in it. This is actually one that I made of all the things you can make bootleg liquor, liquor out of. But um, this one, you know, so they, these are my attempts to kind of show how a lenticular print goes, these little animations. When you look at them in life, they're a little bit different. But um, the, this one also talks, the, the color shift is meant to illustrate the change in, you know, from green seeds to frozen seeds. So the x-ray collages, while maintaining the visual acuity and detail of the other photographs, invite a certain slippage between what is shown in the photograph and what the photograph is actually about. So I'm in interested in creating work that is metaphoric, escapes categorization, and can draw out the subtle details that will allow for multiple interpretations and resonate with many of the questions I have about the race between reproductive power and extinction. For instance, um, now this is pretty washed out, sorry about that. Um, this collage of seeds that took so long to create, I listened to all of Moby Dick on audiobook <laughs> while I was painstakingly pa placing these individual tiny, tiny seeds one by one. Um, they may look like tiny insects or floating plankton clouds or even the Milky Way. And this is a detail of it that shows you how tiny those seeds are. But, um, and for me, the open-ended quality is exactly what I'm after as I think about shifting scales from the tiny seeds to the collective effort to save our plant life and through those efforts, possibly the human race itself. And sometimes this fictional, symbolic, and imaginative imagery causes a friction when placed next to the realism of the photographic images. And I'm hoping that creates a dialogue between them. So seed banks, I'm a professor, so of course I have to give you a little bit of history. You know, there's no like escaping that. Um, so seed banks are based on traditional agricultural practices, uh, but the large institutional collections I uh, photograph are ha also have ties to the Enlightenment and were established at the same times as zoos and museums. And they grew out of private natural history collections and cabinets of curiosity. So some of my works make very direct references to the organizational schema of natural history collections and cabinets of curiosities. So exotic plants were collected, traded, and put on display, and thereby possibly preserving their biodiversity by private individuals, as you can see in my photograph of a 500-year-old citrus collection in a Medici palace in Florence. Um, citrus was just started, you know, was discovered and just being introduced into uh, the West in the 1500s. So when I was in Italy to photograph the uh, Medici Palace and the citrus collection there, I saw the Primavera painting in the Uffizi Gallery. And I was struck by the citrus collection visible in the painting. 
And so um, through research, I later found out that it, there was indeed a connection between that painting and the citrus collection. So um, one of the Medici uh, family had commissioned Botticelli to paint um, this painting. And although the exact meaning of the allegory is still under debate, there are 500 separate, perfectly identifiable species of plants in the painting. So the relationship, uh, well, sorry, I should let y'all look at that for a minute and see how many you can, <laughs> right? All right, we'll have a, well, like however many y'all can guess gets a jelly bean later. So, um, so this relationship between artistic documentation of scientific collections and the interpretation by artists, specifically access to rare and valuable botanical specimens, like citrus at the time, co connected profoundly with my experience at the seed banks. So in my case, um, scientists have been invaluable collaborators, not only for sharing their research with me and providing access to these highly secure spaces and rare specimens, but also through longer term con collaborations, which sometimes included the, them growing uh, seeds for me to x-ray. The collaborating scientists also uh, influenced my choice of which banks to include in the project. Um, through con conversations, I encountered extraordinary accounts of the deep history behind seed banking and uh, the quest to preserve biodiversity. And many times these were stories of close calls and species surviving against the odds. Um, and these, these artworks, uh, these specific ones, were inspired by Alfred R Russell Wallace's Cabinets of Curiosities. And they're all, the, this slide and the next one are only um, specimens from Britain. So back to the story of close calls. So in one story, while I was photographing in the um, Millennium Seed Bank in Sussex, I came across this kind of singular plant in the lush greenhouse, research greenhouse they had. And I was surprised to learn that the small plant had an unusual provenance that embodied the history of British overseas botanical explorations, collecting, and conquest. A family had discovered a leather pouch of unidentified seeds uh, collected in a distant lands by a seafaring ancestor. And although the seeds had been left unattended for 200 years in an attic um, with the care, under the care of the Millennium Seed Bank, they germinated and a species that was thought to be extinct was uh, reanimated. Um, so this individual captain had saved a, saved a species. So uh, this is actually red yucca, which is a, something that's a, like a garden plant in Texas. And the reason I'm using it is that I love the fact that it looks like the structure of the seed banks themselves. So this story of expeditions and global exchange is just one of the many possible uh, stories that could be told from the exchange of materials and information between the new and old worlds that began after 1492. And this exchange continues today in seed banking. This collage includes x-rays from the US and Australian seed banks that they've gathered from all over the world. And I've combined them, these particular ones together because they're all focused on plants that are able to survive in hyper-arid desert locations, and which is a predicted change for some agricultural areas due to the influence of climate change. And the use of delft or indigo blue in the x-ray collages references not only the process of cryogenic preservation I mentioned before, but for, over time came to mean for me to refer to the movement and intersection of east and west, trade, cultural exchange, and migration. So as I worked on this project, I became interested in crops I, I saw in multiple seed banks. A species I kept encountering is corn. In the present day, corn is very important because it's used for both food and fuel. So the U.S. Bank collects a wide range of diverse kinds of corn to ensure biodiversity in our supply in order to create resilience against pests or pathogens. This collage is inspired by the variations in corn and the husk goes around each kernel, kind of like garlic, instead of a whole ear, which they don't know what possible help that might be, but they save it because they just, you know, with a rapidly changing environment, you don't know what you'll need. So thinking about the lack of diversity in the corn crop and our interest in homogeneity, I made collages for x-rays of individually produced corn products. These are nacho cheese flavored Doritos. 
So, um, so I've, enco I've encountered other threats to preserving biodiversity. Ac access to economic resources is a factor that affects even the largest banks. This is the Russian National Collection of Barley, and it's in terrible conditions in Kuban province. Um, the size and condition of the uh, seed bank collections are not necessarily a reflection of the richness of their country's bi botanical diversity, but rather a reflection of the resources they were able to devote to this effort. So even the U.S. bank is uh, dependent on what the Congress is willing to fund. Other areas, other threats may be the loss of habitat and the resulting decline in populations of plants. Finite is inspired by the story from Australia about a plant that only exists in a location about the size of this projection. And it was discovered in a mining expedition, uh, like a mining company was coming in, was doing a botanical expedition to survey what plants were there. So it's in immediate danger of extinction. And the image looks like you might be peering through a microscope or a telescope, and I called it finite because even though we think of life as infinite, it's in fact finite. So in the face of these risks to preserving biodiversity, there are helpful moments such as the networks of scientists working in remote locations such as Cuba and Russia, who are dedicating themselves to creating centers of protected biodiversity. Supporting their efforts is an expansive professional network that fosters the exchange of research and botanical materials to safeguard the future. It's an honor that I've had the opportunity to witness the botanical research exchange firsthand, which brings me back to Svalbard in my last slide. Um, so this box shows, uh, you know, when I was there in 2010, this was the accessions that were going into the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. And the U.S. boxes are on the right-hand side of the, of the image, and on the left-hand side is this little tiny box, the little red box. The little red box is from Uganda. And, you know, at first when I saw that, you know, only one box of seeds and a repurposed box were sent to Svalbard, I was totally disheartened, and I thought, how much resources matter? And then um, I thought about it in another way, that, you know, two, one or two resource, resourceful people, we don't know, you know, seed bank scientists found a way to get these seeds in a box and get them to Svalbard. So these seeds, these species are safe. And um, so, you know, we don't know what the future will be, but that one act changed the trajectory of the future. And um, even a little change when considered over 200 years might make a big difference. So thank you. Thank you.